Okay, can people hear me? We can hear you, Giles. That's fine to start. Okay. So, um, welcome to today's Faraday Masterclass, uh, which is about fast software for simulating battery operation. So, uh, while you're waiting, um, please can you introduce yourself into the chat box and select all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comments. So um, the, the way this, this is going to work is for uh, the first half an hour, we're going to talk about um, the Faraday software, um, the Newman models. And while we're giving the talk, you can uh, type in questions into the comment box as illustrated on the right hand side of your screen. And uh, these will be monitored. And then at the end of the talk, uh, we'll uh, try and address uh, those questions in the, in the remaining Running, running part of the hour. So a, a few words about best practice. Um, the first one is, if at all possible, if you can avoid distraction or multitasking, um, that helps engage with the talk. Secondly, if you can make sure to introduce yourself in, into the chat box. And then uh, throughout the talk, you can uh, um, post questions or post comments about the talk. And as I said, we'll get round to, to those at the end of the talk. And then I don't think you really need to uh, think too hard about the four and five, they're fairly uh, common sense. So the main presenters of the talk are gonna be uh, Dr. Robert Timms, who's at Oxford, who's a, a postdoc on the, on the Faraday uh, multi-scale modeling project. And Dr. Jamie Foster, who's at uh, Portsmouth, Portsmouth who's a, um, a lecturer in, in applied mathematics. So, both, both presenters have got interests in, in computational modeling. Um, and then the objectives of the talk, uh, I'm going to start off and I'm going to review the standard macroscopic model of uh, battery performance, which is uh, something called the Doyle, Doyle Fuller Newman model, which you've probably heard of as, uh, it's more commonly known as a Newman model. And uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the parameterization of a model and why um, parameterizing the model is really important uh, if you if you want to get a, a model that's uh, quantitatively correct and that can actually predict experiments and then move on to um, just briefly introduce uh, Faraday's uh, Newman Newman model software um, before handing over to uh, Jamie who will talk about Dandelion which is one of the packages and Robert who'll talk about PyBound, which is the other. So um, very briefly, um, why might you uh, worry about macro scale battery models and why, why are they useful? Um, you can use them to give predictions of battery performance. Uh, so for example, that uh, you can think about something like a drive cycle um, where you know what the, the current uh, of the battery um, the, you, you know what the current draw from the battery is and you want to predict what the, the voltage of the battery um, is gi given a particular current or you can use it to, to do things like predict state of health uh, or state of charge of a battery and you can also use ex um, these models to guide your experiments or to interpret uh, data from experiments. Um, and the nice thing about the Doyle Fuller Newman model is it can be related to the microscale physics. So, for example, you can um, use uh, DFT calculations to parameterize some of the models that go into the lithium, uh, the lithium, the macroscopic lithium transport models that you use in the Doyle uh, Fuller Newman model. So, a brief review of the uh, uh, Doyle Fuller Newman model is. Is, is given, hang on. Uh, 
need to go back a slide. There we go. Right, so I'm going to start off with this uh, brief review of the doyle fuller newman model. So this is a model for a, a, a planar cell, um, as illustrated in this cartoon uh, at the top of the page. And here you see um, you've got two electrodes, you've got an anode and a cathode separated by a porous spacer. And the electrodes are particulate, so um, they're composed, these, these small balls are me meant to represent the, um, the particles of active material. And then the whole thing is bathed in electrolyte. And so you've got uh, transport occurring both within the electrode particles um, and within the electro electrolyte, which runs across the whole cell. So you've got two, two, two scales to this model. There's a macro scale dimension, which is the dimension running across the cell and a microscale dimension, which is the dimension of, of the individual particles. So, and um, the macroscale uh, model is obtained by uh, at volume averaging um, some equations for the electrolyte. And then this couples to microscale diffusion equations for lithium transport inside the individual electrode particles. Um, and the, the physics uh, that goes into the model, there's really four key components to the physics. There's lithium transport in the electrode material, uh, where the lithium is in solid solution. And then you've got lithium and charge transport in the electrolyte. Um, and, and those two transport mechanisms couple together via a charge transfer uh, reaction that occurs at the interface between um, the electrode particles and the electrolyte. So in other words, on the surface of the electrode particles. And the, the final piece of physics is you need to account for charge transport in the electrode matrix, but that's fairly straightforward, that's Ohm's law. Now, what I'd like to emphasize is that um, in order to get this model working well, you need to parameterize it properly and you need to spend quite a bit of time thinking about parameterizing the model properly. Um, so if I start first with the electrolyte transport, the model needs to account for the dependence of uh, lithium diffusivity and uh, uh, the electric conductivity of the electrolyte. And so the dependence of that on the lithium concentration in the electrolyte. And so we've taken data uh, for uh, LIPF6, which is one of the very common electrolytes from this paper by uh, Ecker in 2015, and fitted uh, to that data and so the, the bottom two graphs show how the diffusivity and the conductivity depend upon lithium concentration. Um, active material transport is also really important um, because it's, it's, it's absolutely key to the performance of the battery. And it turns out for most materials, um, the, the mobility of the lithium is very, very sensitive upon the concentration within the material. Um, and in fact, uh, for something like graphite, you, you get a variation in diffusivity of lithium, which is almost four orders of magnitude, depending on the concentration. And what that means is that if you try and uh, model transport within the elect electrode particles via a linear diffusion equation, you get very poor results. And so here we've fitted to, again, to data from ECHA um, for graphite and this variant of NMC, um, the data is in black, the fit is in red, and uh, that turns out to be an adequate fit in order to get really rather good results. And the final component to uh, a, a data fitting that you need to do in order to get the model working well is uh, for the Butler-Volmer equation. So the Butler-Volmer equation is, is the equation that tells you what the um, current is that goes across the edge of the uh, electrode particle into the electrolyte. And that's a function of this thing, uh, the overpotential, 
which is essentially the potential difference between the electrode and the electrolyte with this equilibrium potential or open circuit voltage subtracted off from that potential difference. So when the over potential is zero, um, the current goes to zero. Um, and as you go through zero, the current reverses. And this is the, the, the thing you need to get correct here is the open circuit voltage for your um, particular material. So on the left hand side, you see uh, an open circuit voltage for graphite uh, in the middle for NMC and on the right for LFP. And, and for graphite and NMC, there's, there's really quite a marked variation in open circuit potential with changes in concentration in lithium in, in, the, in the electrode material. And if you throw all of that together, um, you, can, you can actually get uh, very, very accurate simulations of uh, real experimental data. And that's not just discharge charge curves. So we've uh, gone and tested this out on drive cycle data, which I think is a relatively severe test of the model. And we've compared to some experimental results that uh, Alana uh, Aragonzulka in Lancaster has for a Samsung, Samsung Graphite NTA cell, and also that Ferran Brossa has in Warwick. And they both show very good agreement. So I'm gonna show you Alana's results here. Um, in the top figure, you see uh, the, the, the current draw that's been taken off the uh, cell as a function of time. So you can see it's very non-uniform current draw. And then in the bottom figure, a compar bottom two figures, there's a comparison between the uh, voltage of the cell that's measured experimentally and the voltage predicted by the model. So the voltage predicted by the model is in orange and the experimental voltage is in black. And you see that there's amazingly good agreement between the two. Um, so I want to say a little bit about the motivation of why uh, we spent so much time writing these codes. And the reason really is that the commercial codes that are available are, are, are quite slow. And that's fine when you're considering a single cell. But in reality, you might um, very well like to consider something like a pouch cell or a, um, a jelly roll cell, uh, which are, are, are quite large. So for example, a pouch cell is composed of uh, 50 single cells, around 50 single cells stacked upon each other. And it might have a size comparable to something like a, a pack of coffee. And because it's so large, uh, it, can, it can heat up significantly and the different parts of the cell get to, to, to really quite different temperatures. And that wouldn't be a problem except that um, the electrochemistry of a cell is very temperature dependent. And in particular, the hotter the cell gets, the easier it is for, to, for it to discharge and therefore the, um, the hotter it gets. And so you get this sort of runaway, uh, you can get this runaway process of, of heating in particular parts of your pouch cell. So in order to properly model a pouch cell, you have to account for the non-uniform temperature throughout the, uh, the three-dimensional pouch cell. And uh, you then have to couple that to uh, the Doyle-Fuller-Newman model, but the, you need to solve the Doyle-Fuller-Newman model, model at every um, space point within the pouch cell. And since the uh, Newman model is two-dimensional, um, the problem for the entire pouch cell is five-dimensional. And it's well known that such high-dimensional problems are extremely challenging. Um, and in order to solve them and get accurate solutions, you need really very fast and efficient code. Um, so um, the, as far as Faraday software for the DFM model is concerned, there are two packages we're gonna talk about. The first of these is called Dandelion, and that's uh, an ultra fast, accurate code um, and it's very powerful, which means it can tackle very large systems. It's easy to use, so there's no coding re experience required, and it has a library of chemistries, which we hope to enlarge as the project goes on. And it has uh, this 3D uh, thermal electrochemical capability for pouch cells, and uh, we hope to extend that to jelly roll cells in the near future. In contrast, PyBam Pi is uh, has a slightly different focus. It's still very fast code, but it's designed to be extensible. And the idea beyond, behind PyBam is really that uh, 
uh, is for prototyping a new model. So for example, if you wanted to uh, look at something like lithium plating, you might want to modify the Newman model a bit to incorporate lithium plating into the Newman model. And you can do that uh, fairly straightforwardly through PyBAM. And similar to Dandelion, it has a library of chemistries and it also has some other features. For example, it includes accurate single particle approximations, which can be used to enhance the speed of uh, your calculation for given uh, cells and for given discharge rates. Um, and then a very brief review of the advantages over uh, commercial packages, and these really come down to the speed and the power of these uh, PyBAM and Dandelion. Uh, they're, they're much faster um, and speed is important, not just for uh, these thermal electrochemical problems, but also for things like optimization and parameter estimation, where you have to make a, a large number of computations in order to arrive to your answer. And I'm going to hand over to Jamie now, uh, who'll take over the presentation. Okay, uh, so... Hello, everybody. Um, and well, first thing to say is thanks for responding to the poll that we put up earlier. So there's uh, 130 something of you here, uh, and it looks like a majority of you are interested in these kinds of models for um, supplementing experiments that you're doing. Uh, so that's super helpful information for us to know. Uh, and well, hopefully that will play into future developments uh, for us. Could I have the next slide, Giles? Okay, good. So I'm going to go into a bit more depth on uh, Dandelion. And I guess the first thing to say is uh, what you need to do to install uh, the program. Um, so we'll take you through kind of in-depth instructions on how to do that in the workshops that we've got coming up uh, in the subsequent weeks. Uh, but the thing I want to highlight here is that it's very easy to do independent of the platform you're on. So if you're a Windows user, a Mac user or a Linux user, uh, the installation is straightforward. And even uh, if you want to install this on a high performance computing uh, type hardware, you can go and do that as well. Uh, so once you've uh, done the install, um, Dandelion comes with a, a few kind of default simulations just for you to test that your installation is working properly. Uh, and one of the default simulations is just a simple discharge curve uh, of a graphite NMC cell. So you'll see the output uh, of one of the default simulations in the bottom left uh, corner of the slide. And while the simulation is running, uh, which by the way for this uh, particular example takes about a second uh, on a kind of typical laptop computer, and that's at the kind of fidelity that you can expect uh, three or four digits of accuracy in your solution. So they're uh, well-resolved solutions. Uh, the, the running of the simulation will be accompanied by uh, a kind of live plot of what's happening inside your virtual cell. So if you look in the top right of the slide, you'll see uh, the live output that accompanies a simulation uh, that I'm talking about. And you can see you get uh, live updates of concentration profiles uh, and potential profiles throughout the cell. And uh, output from the simulation, so things like these concentration and potential profiles, uh, cell voltages, are saved to text files so that you can, uh, after the simulation is finished, you can read the data into uh, MATLAB or Paraview or whatever it is you like to use to make your plots and get your pictures ready for uh, papers that you might be writing. And I should just say that the output can be customized. So if you're interested in a particular uh, feature of what's going on inside the cell, you can tell Dandelion about that and it will uh, save that data for you as well. Okay, so once you've run a default simulation, perhaps the next thing you might like to do is tweak some parameters of your cell. So maybe you wanna change the C rate or you wanna make uh, one electrode thicker, for example. Uh, the way that you would do that would be to open up uh, the parameters file. You can see a screenshot of that in the bottom right uh, of the slide. And there are various uh, lines in there. You just change the number next to the property that you'd like to alter, uh, save the text file and press go again and you will uh, simulate this, this new cell that you've uh, parameterized. 
Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so a couple more words uh, about the parameterizations that are available in Dandelion. Uh, one thing we've done is to make sure that you've got uh, some parameterizations for commercial cells kind of built in to the software. Uh, so working with the people uh, listed under the bullet points there, we've got um, we've got parameterizations for CoCam cells, uh, a Samsung cell, and an LG cell. And we also have um, what we call a chemical library. So we've kind of scraped the literature for uh, properties for things like graphite, NCA, NMC, and LFP. And so with uh, relative ease, you can go and swap in different electrode chemistries um, as you wish so that you can go and compare them to your experiments. And a little note here, so if you have other parameterizations that you'd like to be available in Dandelion, please tell us about it. Uh, and hopefully we can work together to build those in as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a result that Giles has already showed, so I shan't uh, reiterate how good the agreement is here. Um, what I do want to point out is the kind of uh, computational resource that's required to uh, do a simulation like this. So in the orange box on the right, you'll see a uh, kind of indicator of that. So this takes less than a minute on a standard desktop machine. So this is a kind of machine that I imagine everyone has available. And to put into context just how quick that is, the kind of window of real time that's being simulated here is about seven and a half hours. Um, and the computational time, as I say, is less than a minute. So we're really running these simulations at orders of magnitude faster uh, than happens in reality. And that opens up the possibility for using uh, these software tools for control purposes and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the other kind of major selling point for Dandelion is that it can do these very large systems. Um, and I don't want to go too in depth on this, but typically in computing, as you increase the size of a system, uh, the computational cost gets very large very, very quickly. Uh, and in Dandelion, we've worked hard to make sure that it exhibits something called linear scaling. And what this means is that you can, as you increase the numbers of equations that you're trying to solve, your computational cost does go up, but only in proportion to the number of equations you have. So it remains manageable uh, for longer. And to give you some idea of what we can do, uh, we can solve uh, tens of millions of equations uh, in less than half an hour, again, on uh, computing resources that everyone has available to them. Uh, and you may well ask, well, why why should I care about that? Why is that important? Uh, and if we flip to the next slide, uh, I've got an example of why that's important. So here is uh, a meshing of a cocam pouch cell. Uh, so there are 48 uh, cells stacked within the pouch. And each of those 48 cells uh, has been discretized uh, in a 12 by 36 grid. And if you write down a a fully fledged electrochemical model on this geometry, roughly what you're asking to do is solve 5 million equations. Uh, so this really is a lot of computational expense. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see a video of a result of a simulation like this. Uh, so this cell's being discharged at 1C. Uh, we're solving, as I said, the fully fledged electrochemical model uh, and predicting the temperature within the cell um, and we've done, done boundary conditions here, here where the cell is thermally isolated, except for at the tabs. So if you look on the left-hand edge of the simulation, you can see the evidence of uh, some cooling going on via tabs there. And even though this simulation is very heavy lifting computationally, uh, we can still run uh, simulations, even of this complexity, faster than reality. So... This is a 1C discharge, so you're seeing a real-time window of about an hour, um, and you can do simulations like this on a laptop in about half an hour. Um, okay, so that's all I've got to say about Dandelion for now. Uh, there'll be another poll question coming up momentarily, 
So we'll give you a bit of time to respond to that and then we'll hand over to uh, Robert. Thanks. Oh, uh, hi everyone, yeah, I'll just start out by just finishing up that poll and then I can uh, relay the results to you as they come in. Um, oh, they've come in now, so I'll do that before I get started then. Um, so it looks like uh, most people currently who are here neither use nor develop models, but of those who do, most people seem to use models rather than develop new models. Um, so they seem to have more users here rather than developers. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm going to take a few minutes now just to talk about PyBAM, um, this other package that we've been developing and try and talk about uh, what our idea was with PyBAM and what the sort of focus of this package is compared with Dandelion. And then I'll show you some examples of things you can do in PyBAM uh, before we finish off. So really we wanted to make something that was a framework that allowed people to easily build, solve and share battery models as well. Um, and the idea of this was that it would be fast, flexible and modular. So it's very easy to chop and change things. So as Giles said earlier at the start, you know, it's a good tool for prototyping new models um, because you can quickly swap out one piece of physics for another. So if you want to change the description of what's happening in the particles for the transport in there, you can change that uh, very easily. And really the idea is, is that it's trying to encourage collaboration across the whole battery community, uh, particularly within Faraday. So there's lots of great work happening across lots of different work packages in Faraday. People thinking about degradation, people doing experiments, people doing reduced order models. And I want to try and bring lots of that together so that everyone can benefit from all the good research that's going on. So in terms of what's in PyBAM, it's got lots of the standard models, like the newer model that we saw earlier, um, in the standard sort of 1D geometry, and you can do pouch cells as well. Um, but these are all based around this modular framework, so they're easy to chop and change. Um, and then like Dandelion, we've got a library of different chemistries um, and different types of cells. All of these models can be fully coupled with thermal models, so you can include temperature effects in any of these models. Um, something else we've worked quite hard on is to implement an experimental suite uh, within PyBAM so it's really easy for people to supplement their experiments um, with a bit of modelling. Um, so if we go to the next slide please. So before I show you some examples of things you can do with PyBAM, I just want to mention um, you can go to our website pybam.org and there's lots of examples and documentation there. Um, but something that makes the software quite easy to use and develop in is that we've got a very active and open community um, of people currently working on PyBAM or using PyBAM in their research. Um, this diagram here just shows the current um, contributors to PyBAM. So these are people who are contributing codes to PyBAM and putting models into PyBAM and they've got more people using it as well. Um, but we've got a very active community so it's easy to get help um, with anything you want to do. And if you want to get involved with that you can get on GitHub. We've got a Slack channel you can email me if you want to be added to that and my details will be at the end. And it's also easy to install, much like Dandelion. Um, it's cross-platform. It's available on the PyPy package listing, so you can just pip install it like any other Python package. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So we tried to make this an interface for using PyBAM as straightforward as possible, so that if you just want to run something out of the box, a pre-existing model like the door for the newer model, it's really simple to do so. So here you just take, you import the package, you tell it you want to load up the door for the newer model, you throw that model into your simulation, you hit solve, you hit plot, and you get a standard um, set of plots out at the end. And this is fully customizable, so you can choose which variables you want to plot and so on. And um, if you run this on a computer, this will be a slider plot, so you can drag backwards and forwards in the time you simulate it over. Um, but all of these things that you see here are fully customizable. So with the model, you can change, you know, you might want to include thermal effects or not in this particular model. Um, you might want to change the parameters you're using. Um, in terms of the simulation, you might want to change tolerances for the solver. Um, you might want to change and do something a bit more interesting in the constant current discharge. Um, so we've got some examples in the following slides that just show you some of the things you can change. Okay, next slide, please. So one thing we try to do is to make it really easy to supplement your experiments with some modeling. So we've got this experiment class that lets you write out any experiment protocol in sort of plain English. So there's some keywords that let you do certain things, but you can basically specify any power, current or voltage control um, just using text strings and then you can pass that um, experiment into your simulation and then it will go away and, and run that experiment for you. Um, so hopefully this makes it very easy for people who perhaps aren't familiar with modelling or coding to just go away and do some simulations of their experiment. And again, you can combine this with different models, with different pieces of physics, so you can try and figure out what's going on in the experiment 
And as we mentioned at the start of this talk, um, in Giles' introduction, you, know, you can use this to sort of prototype experiments you might want to run. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So some of the other things you can um, change in these simulations, so as I said, you can uh, choose different parameter sets and it's easy to pick these. You can either select them by referencing a particular paper. So here's a um, parameter set for an LGM 50 cell from the paper Chen 2020 is the reference. So that just collects all the parameters from one paper and lets you use those in your simulation. But if you want more control over that, you can choose um, parameters by components, so by anode, cathode, etc. And even more so, it's, it's very easy to tweak an existing parameter set if you just want to change a few values or include your own parameters. So these are just um, housed as CSV files that you can add your own um, parameters to. Um, we can simulate drive cycles, so you can provide some current um, as data. So you can just, again, give a CSV file with current as a function of time, for example, and throw that into the simulation, it'll go away and do that for you. And as we saw already, it's, it's easy to sim simulate um, experimental protocols, so you might do some standard things like GITT, for example. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Something else it's very easy to do in PyBam is compare different models. So because we've tried to make this framework as modular and flexible as possible, it means it's very easy to prototype different models to include different physical effects. And when you do that, you might want to compare um, these two models that include one piece of physics or not. Or if you're in someone who's interested in developing reduced order models, you might want to see how does your reduced order model um, compare to the full model, for example. And in PyBam, it's very easy to do. You can just create a list of all the models you want to compare and then loop over that list to solve them all. And you can throw all of that your solutions at our um, plotting interface and automatically generate um, plots that compare all of the uh, different models that you've included. And again, yeah, to give a typical um, idea of sort of simulation time, this has solved the Doyle Fuller new model and a slightly simpler model called the single particle model. And in total, this took about just over half a second to, to simulate both of those. Um, next slide, please. Um, so something else I wanted to make it easy to do is to interface with other software, um, just to extend the applicability or the usability of PyBAM. So our primary focus has been on sort of one dimensional models, although you can do uh, pouch cell models in PyBAM as well at the moment. But if you want to do some modeling in a different geometry, say a jelly roll, or if you're interested in some pack level simulations, you might want to combine PyBAM with a different modeling framework, um, so just like an equivalent circuit model. So in this example, we've got an equivalent circuit model for charge and thermal transport on the jelly roll scale. And this is coupled to PyBAM, which models the electrochemistry on the local scale. So it's very easy to sort of combine PyBAM with other softwares to really extend it to, to different scenarios, which might be particularly interesting for people who are wanting to do PACS level simulations, but with some electrochemical um, physics based modeling combined with that. Um, I think that's all the examples I've got here really. Um, just want to give you a flavour of what's going on, but as Jamie said, we've got tech sessions coming up um, in the coming weeks for both Dandelion and PyBAM. So if you're interested in learning more about it, um, you can go to our website and come along to those tech sessions and um, see what we can do. Um, but I think I'll stop there so that we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, I don't know, Giles, are you doing the ending bit or um, someone else maybe, I'm not sure. Okay. Thanks. So, I mean, this is just the information uh, for where you uh, uh, find out more about these packages. Um, so you can uh, contact, uh, you, can, you can look at the PyBAM website or email Robert. Um, and uh, if, you, if you want to download Dandelion, then uh, you can get access to our GitHub page by emailing Jacqueline Edge. Um, and for technical queries, uh, the best person to ask is Ivan Karotkin, who's uh, responsible for most of the, the, the coding of Dandelion. And uh, yeah, so he's, he's really the best person to ask. And so... This is uh, the next next week's Faraday Masterclass, and I'm going to um, hand you over to to Fran for the questions now. So I think we'll we'll all try and answer the questions.
Giles, I'm very happy for you to um, pose the questions. There's one here to get you started though. A uh, very interesting talk, um, Sifel says, around slides 11 and 12, I think you mentioned transport and electroparticles. Do you consider interference or growing boundary effects and can you extract their influence across the electrode? Thanks, Sifel. So the, what, what we do there is uh, we're using a, a crude model, this nonlinear diffusion model that um, implicitly takes account of the grain boundary effects um, because it's, it's quantified against experiment. So presumably if you make a, a graphite electrode particle, it depends on how you, you make it uh, as to what the coefficients in the, in the nonlinear diffusion equation should be. So I, I don't think all graphite particles will be the same. And similarly, I, I doubt that all NMC particles will be the same. So at the moment, we haven't, we haven't gone into the, the details of how, how grain boundaries uh, or how the number of grain boundaries, density of grain boundaries affects the nonlinear diffusion. Hope that's answered the question. Okay, are there more questions then? Fran. If you click the Q&A box at the bottom, Giles, you can see the questions that have been asked. So there's one, uh, so there's one from Aaron Walsh, uh, kind of answered it in the chat, but uh, so Aaron was asking uh, about whether uh, we can use these things uh, to interface with machine learning. Um, so just, just to vocalize the answer, I guess, uh, I'm par paraphrasing my answer that I gave, but something uh, something along the lines of that I don't see any reason why uh, either of these software tools couldn't be used as a kind of um, a pseudo experiment, if I could put it that way. So you can use uh, the the softwares to generate uh, you know data sets in inverted commas that you could then feed to your uh, machine learn learning algorithm. Um, train it off that so presumably there's potential there because you can you know because the simulations are so quick to do you can generate bigger data sets than you could with you know, real experimental apparatus um, do you want to give me another question i can i can give you another question so this is from james lahu uh, who asks, uh, we mentioned uh, that each of the softwares have material databases for parameters. Uh, so first part, are they the same in both softwares? And what do you see as next steps for parameterizations for expanding the databases? So I don't think that they are the same for both softwares. I think we've done them independently, um, but they're probably pretty similar. Yeah, um, I, I don't some, know. Some of the sets are shared, I think. So we've got things like the Echo set and the set from right. Fran and LGM50. So I think there's some overlap, but maybe we should um, coordinate on that to make sure that yeah. everyone's got the best sets of parameters for both softwares. Um, and, and personally, I think the more, more data sets we have that we can incorporate into the library, the better. Because the more data sets you have, the more useful the package becomes. I mean, yeah, as long as you're fairly happy about the, the, the quality of those data sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to, so to answer the next steps thing, I mean, one thing we can obviously do is keep our eye on the literature and kind of, uh, you know, plug in more parameters as they become available. But with the kind of wealth of experiments that are being done within Faraday, it would be great if, uh, you know, people in our consortium could, you know, feed us feed us data that they want available for models and we can uh, yeah make those available for you kind of ahead of ahead of the game so to speak um should I, should I have another question or is there anything yeah. else you want to say about that okay uh so the next question this is from uh stephen parry who says are the simulation codes unique or are there other codes available uh, and a follow-on question, if there are other codes, have the results been compared? Uh, also useful to know how far the codes have been benchmarked to real experimental results. Um, as to whether they're 
I mean, there are other codes that solve the Doyle Fuller Newman model. Um, so there are commercial codes such as uh, Comsol. There's one that Dassault has called Dimula. Um, and I, I'm sure that there are other commercial codes available, but they, they're, they're all much slower. Um, we have benchmarked against uh, various experiments. So uh, for dandelion, this is so against uh, that experiment you saw from Alana and also against uh, experiments you've seen from Ferran and uh, I think even has, has done some other stuff as well. I know that uh, um, PIBAM has been benchmarked against um, COMSOL and we've benchmarked against Dimula in terms of other, other computing packages. Do you have anything to add to that, Robert? Um, I guess we've also compared with Dandelion, so that PIBAM and Dandelion give the same results. So I guess by proxy, yeah. they will compare. Um, yeah, we'll also compare to Fran's uh, data set directly. Yeah, I, th I think it would be fair to say that we've done our due diligence in comparing. I, th I think we're confident that they're genuinely solving the equations we claim they're solving properly. I think that's... Yeah, I think hopefully we can collaborate more in the future with more people as a result of this to so that people right. use it more and then more people use it, the more validation we get, I guess. So. Right, yeah. Ongoing. Um, okay, uh, next question. Anything else you want to add to that? Or? Or no. Okay, so this is one from uh, Nivedita. Apologies if I've pronounced that wrong. Um, so question is, can we model lithium sulfur? Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that uh, as far as, I mean, Robert, do you know anything about lithium sulfur? Have you tried to, to do that? We've got some people who are interested in doing lithium sulfur and I think have started to think about it. So if you're interested in doing it, maybe email me and I can put you in touch with them. Would be my answer. Okay. Good. All right. Um, okay, so one from John Owen. Uh, do we calculate electrode tortuosity uh, using the Brueggemann approximation as uh, Newman did or do we do something cleverer or we don't care because it doesn't make any difference? Um, so we currently use Brueggemann but the tortuosity is in there as a submodel so it's you know you can extend it to include different effects we're talking to people about you know people are doing simulations at a different length scale to us to try and give us those effective properties um, does it make any difference? Uh, I don't know if I can answer that question right now. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe. Um, but in short, it would be, we currently use Brueggemann, but yeah, we're thinking about using other things to calculate those effective properties. But at the end of the day, I think when you get to the macro scale equations, you just want a number. Yeah. I mean, to, to answer that question slightly differently, I mean, so users are free to specify what they like for permeability. So if a user has a has a preference on this, like if somebody particularly wants to use Brueggemann or somebody particularly doesn't want to use Brueggemann, they're free to do that. So, um, yeah. I mean, the, a, another way of, of putting it is if you have image data, it's actually relatively straightforward to, to calculate um, the, the perme permeability that you, you should stick into the equations. Uh, I know that James LaHue, for example, has got loads and loads of image data from uh, UCL and has been doing exactly this um, calculation. So uh, if, if, if you have a particular battery in mind and uh, somebody's uh, gone and uh, constructed a three-dimensional dim image of, of what the electrode looks like, then you can use that three-dimensional image. Um, and I, I think James has has got some package that does this, and I can't remember what it's called. Is it, is it Pore Spy, Jamie? Uh, there is a package Spy. called Pore Spy that does um, something like that. Yeah, so I'm not sure if that's James's, but is it Open uh, Impala, I think, or yeah. So, like so, so you don't you don't need um, 
the, the point is that it's not actually incorporated into either of these packages, but what you would do if you wanted to do that is you would, you would go and use one of these other packages, so like Paw Spy or Open Impala, um, in order to compute the, the number that you stick into Dandelion or the number that you stick into to Python for the permeability. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so there's a, more questions here. I'm, I'm going to be selfish and ask a question from me to the audience and ask them to put the answer in the chat, if I may. Uh, so I'll just ask a question, which is that, so from the first poll, it seems like most people are wanting to use these softwares to compare to experiment. So maybe something useful that you could tell us in the chat or in the Q&A uh, would be what experiments in particular you want to uh, but these bits of software against. Um, so if, if, if there are any thoughts about that, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear them. Uh, uh, another question from the audience. So this is from Chuan Cheng, uh, who asks, uh, when using uh, Dandelion or PyBAM to simulate a single cell, uh, would you calculate the overpotential distribution, reaction rate distribution, and lithium ion concentration distribution through the thickness of the electrodes? Uh, i.e. in 1D, uh, or through the 2D plane of the electrode? Uh, you can... So I presume you, you're, you're talking about... Um, you'd calculate it in 1D, because it would be the same at every, every point in the 2D plane of the electrode until you get towards the ends. I presume that's what... Yeah, so I, th I think maybe the answer is that you... Yeah, so... You have a choice about that, so um, maybe could you could you pull up the slide with the cocam meshing on it, Giles? Maybe that would be a useful thing to show. This one here. Yeah. So I think this maybe helps articulate the answer to this, which is that so each one of those kind of little grey slabs is a solve of the Newman model. Uh, and so if you wanted the 2D distribution in the electrode, you basically look at that, that kind of tiling there. So they, you can have a series of 1D simulations which mesh a two-dimensional plane, and you can couple those simulations together either thermally or by the potential in the current collectors, for example. Um, I think, I think that do you want to add anything to that, anybody? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think the question is the quantities you get are spatially resolved. And the answer to that is yes, if that's the correct way of reading that question. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's, I hope we answered your question. Um, okay, so next question from uh, Folvos. Uh, he asks, uh, very good to have such software at our disposal uh, from an experimentalist. Um, is the software readily suited to simulate galvanostatic discharge of lithium sulfur cathodes? Uh, so I guess maybe we've kind of answered that already. Uh, so galvanostatic... Galvanostatic discharge, but not necessarily of lithium sulfur. Yeah. So, so I, I think in order... It, I presume it would be relatively straightforward to adapt to do lithium sulfur, but we'd need to know what the model is for lithium sulfur. Yeah. In order yeah. to do that. And yeah, I think it adds like, yeah, we, so yeah, we've got some people thinking about lithium sulfur, but if people are interested in adding new bits of physics or um, different chemistries or so on, then you know, they're free to come and collaborate and try and stick that in. If there is something you want it to do that it doesn't currently do. Next one is from Damica. Uh, he says, given uh, the speed, are you working on parameter estimation code? Um, ideally, if we can provide a drive cycle data set uh, and then get Dandelion to fit a subset of parameters, that would be great. Um, so currently we're not, but um, we'd be very happy to collaborate on this. I know that um, people are doing this in, with PyBAM. I know uh, in particular that Dave Howie 
in Oxford is, is doing parameter estimation with PyBAM. I, Robert, can you fill in any details on that? Yeah, I mean, we're thinking pretty hard about parameter estimation at the minute. That's more the route we're going down rather than doing the sort of big scale problems like the pouch cell stuff that you've seen. We've sort of taken the parameter estimation fork in the road. Um, so a lot, a, lot, a lot of our attention is focused there at the minute. So, and yeah, get in touch. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so the next one is from Chris Skylaris. He says, thank you for the interesting talk. Does your Newman model uh, include, or can it be made to include, non-uniformity of the electrolyte particles, uh, or at least a range of radii of spherical particles? Uh, I assume um, they're currently, currently described by spheres of the same radius. Uh, so at the moment... We, we, we can allow for non-uniformity of, of, of spherical radius in space. So you can have big, big particles, say, near the current collector, small particles near the separator. Um, and I think it, it's, it's something that we're thinking about doing is, is putting in a bimodal distribution. So you can have um, big and small particles at the same point in space. But we haven't yet done that. Yeah, similarly, yeah, we can do graded electrodes at the moment um, and are also, yeah, thinking about particle distributions locally. Okay, good. Um, so, ah, one, so something from James LaHue, who has uh, just shouted open Impala with an exclamation mark, so I'm, guess, <laughs> I'm guessing that's, uh, that's the name of his uh, software for computing tortuosities. Um, so we have a question here from uh, Servan. Uh, it says, very interesting. Uh, short question. Can models be tuned to study, study other battery chemistries? Uh, thinking of um, Na ion. So I guess the same answer for we've already, already given, right? So uh, yes. I mean, the main thing is it is... Uh, is knowing what the model is, so knowing what the equations are for your particular battery chemistry um, and seeing how easy it is to adapt the existing code to, to the, this new set of equations. My feeling is that generally it's, it's not too hard to adapt the Newman model to a different chemistry. I, I know that, uh, um, that the Oxford lot, uh, the, the PyBAM lot have done looked at um, lead, uh, lead acid batteries. Yeah, and I think with PyBAM, it's more of a framework for solving these models rather than a specific implementation of any one model. So we've got people um, using PyBAM for fuel cells as well. Um, and in terms of equations, it's all symbolic. So you can enter your equations in symbolic form um, to get that going. So I think we've, yeah, sort of, thought about how to extend Python to things that aren't lithium ion, definitely. Uh, okay, good. So next question is from Ross, who says, uh, have there been any checks on whether the solutions of the DFN model make sense against experimental data? I mean, not in terms of a current voltage response, but the accuracy of the other states, uh, potentials, concentrations, internal currents, Etc., uh, as these are useful for control. Uh, it's, I think it's quite hard to find uh, measurements of the internal uh, states of the cell. I mean, I'd be very interested to see what you you had on it. So if well, you could, so, uh, so maybe maybe I can answer a little bit. So one one thing I've seen like this is people using MRI measurements to map concentrations inside insertion material in operando uh, and we have compared against that so we have done um, a comparison for a graphite anode uh, using a DFN model there's a paper on that uh, so the list of authors is quite long, but it's uh, 
Sergei Krachkovsky is the lead author, and it's in Journal of, Journal of Physical Chemistry C. It's called something like Operando Mapping of Graphite Electrodes. I, I'm an author on it as well. Um, <coughs> so I think that's, as far as I know, that's the closest we've come to doing that. Uh, Have you got anything else to add to that, Robert? Or? Um, no, I don't think so in terms of that, no. Okay. Um, I would be interested to to hear what, what data people have about the internal states of the cell as, as it's discharged and charged. Right. Um, and if you could, um, sorry, I didn't catch a name. If, if whoever asked that question could get back in, in contact if they have uh, details about experiments that measure the, the internal states of the cell, I think that would be really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so next question or penultimate question, it looks like, is from Sam. Uh, it says, thanks all for an interesting talk. Uh, Jamie, you said that you have been uh, combining the literature to, to add additional materials to the package uh, to consider a new electrode material. Uh, but what chemical information is needed to get an accurate result in these simple 2D models? Um, so I suppose an over potential, um, the, the transport properties, uh, by which I mean diffusivities and conductivities. You, you're going to say something, John, also? Yeah, so the diffusivities in the, um, in the active material are usually measured using uh, GITT. Uh, so that's where most of that data comes from. So if, hang on, if you, if we go back to, um, so there's, for example, here, the, the data that comes from ECHA, there's GITT data and EIS data. I mean, an anecdotes. So, so I guess the kind of uh, glib answer to this question is you need all the parameters to get an accurate simulation. But in my experience, and I think people have done careful studies on this and shown it, is that, you know, some parameters have a much more important influence than other ones. Uh, so anecdotally, I think the over potential makes a huge difference to how good the model is. If you get that wrong, then the model predictions won't be very good. And similarly for the, the diffusivity inside the electrode particle, if you get that wrong, the models won't be very good. Um, and that's probably the hardest thing to measure yeah. is the diffusivity inside the electrode particles. So I, I suppose, yeah, I, I'm not sure if, this isn't a firm answer, but I guess if you get those things right, then you'll probably do all right. And the, mo the more parameters you can provide, the better, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Did you, uh, sorry, Rob, did you? No, I think that's okay, good. Right. Yeah. Uh, so from Billy Wu, uh, very nice. Uh, when simulating degradation processes, the magnitude of the residual error in the reaction current density could affect the eventual lifetime. Uh, what is the magnitude of the residual versus the side reaction current for a simulation which runs with a practical mesh size? So I'm not quite sure what this is. This question, do, do you think, is this question related to conservation of lithium within the, the scheme? Is that Yes, says Billy. Yeah, so we've been very, very careful to write down a conservative scheme for lithium. So there's no, in, in the absence of side reactions, there's no lithium gained or lost um, by, by the model, by, by, by the code. And that, I mean, that was something, when we first started writing code for this, it was pretty apparent that if you, uh, if you if you if you discretized in the wrong way, you end up losing slowly losing lithium over time. So you, you get this numerical degradation of the battery, if you like, which is completely unphysical. So we spent a, a lot of time getting the um, using thinking about what the right elements were in order to to avoid that. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're pretty happy about that in our code. And so you can you can run the 
battery thousands of times in the absence of any degradation mechanism and you, you've got the same amount of lithium there. Okay, so one more question's popped up in the meantime. So this one is from Michael Cornish, who says on slide 13, he thinks, um, is the comparison to the experiment uh, to the same experimental data shown or was the model fit to a different experiment and then simulated to compare to this separate experiment? Uh, no, I think the comparison to the experiment was... Uh, so the fitting was from, uh, sorry, I'd have to ask Ivan about this, but I think the fitting is, is from GITT data. Um, and then this is a simulation based on that fitting. Yeah, I, that, that fits with my memory as well. I think, I think that's correct. But I mean, Ivan, Ivan really has the details about this and he, he, well, Ivan and Alana are currently writing this up. So um, they're, they're, they're really the people to ask about the, the exact details. Okay, good. So I think going on three o'clock, that's the last question answered. Okay. Well, shall we wrap up then? Uh, yeah, I'll let you do that. Oh, sorry, I've hijacked your hosting position. I'll shut up now. Uh, no, that was good. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just going to go back to the next step slide, uh, just so that you have uh, the relevant websites and email addresses uh, in case you want to get more involved with the software. Um, and then please do um, come to the training sessions if you're interested and uh, the training sessions are over the next Jeremy do you remember when the training sessions are next I think they're the next couple of weeks two or three weeks yeah um... can jump in onto that actually jump in here She's, she's not there. All the dates and links for registration for the sessions will go out in an email tomorrow along with the recording. But if people would like to look sooner, if they go to Communify, they're also listed there. Okay, brilliant. I've got them here if you want me to say. Um, Dandelion is 12th and 19th of May and Pi Bum is 2nd and 9th of June. Okay, great. I think the info's on the next slide, Giles. If you flick to the next slide uh, to that, yeah, Communify, people can sign up there and then next week um it's Saiful islam who's going to talk about uh, atomic scale models okay so i think i think that's everything that we've got to say so uh goodbye and thank you very much for attending <laughs> thanks everyone yeah, thank you